just fact check right now. Fact is, I want to total every single roof I get on. Oh, yeah. Every time. Right. 100%. Don't we all? But you can't. You got rules. I got oversight. I got QA. I can't just total everything. Otherwise, I, I'm, my career would have been over super fast. So I'm looking around. I'm looking. I'm looking. You know, I'm looking at the vents. There's nothing on anything. There's the roof. It's not that old of a house. The roof's not very old. And I'm like, listen, dude. I mean, bro. Bro. Listen, pal. Bro. I want to total this roof. I really do. I said, you know, I, but it looks like, you know, there's not really anything I could take a picture of on here. There's, I'm not, I'm not finding what I need to see in order to, to, to justify paying for any, paying anything on this claim, right? There's not, there's no damage to the sides of the house, yada, yada, yada. So he's like, all right, well, that's cool, man. No, no problem. Yeah, we'll, we'll just catch you on the next one, you know, whatever. And so we start down a ladder and get down in the insured's front yard, standing there in the driveway and the homeowner, we knock on the door, the homeowner comes out and he immediately, I start to like say, all right, well, you know, we took a look at the, he cuts me off. And starts in with this whole, yeah, you know, uh, we when we looked at this roof, I mean, we, th- we are absolutely uh, positive there is hail damage on this roof. And your adjuster, he doesn't agree with that. And he, st- he stabbed me right square in the back, twisted the knife in, right. and I was, my mouth just f- hit the floor. I, and I lost it on that kid. Hey, Matt. Hey. What's up, Daddy? So I had this claim, the first claim that I ever had where somebody cried on my shoulder. Really? Yep. It was in 2003. It was at the Scripps Ranch wildfire. And <clears throat> I was the contents adjuster. We, they had split up the structural and the contents between mm-hmm. two people. We drive out there. Uh, I meet the, the structural adjuster and... Um, with the insured at the site of where their house was mm-hmm. and uh, start talking to them. You know, there's, <coughs> it's just a, a footprint, right? There's just, there's so that's, that's, everything's gone. It's completely burned away. And <clears throat> we were instructed to do our best to try to get some money in the insured's hands so that they can buy clothes, so they can buy food, so they can buy, you know, have a place, put them up in a place to stay or to pay them to help reimburse them and get and pay them for their places wherever they're staying. And I wrote some great big gigantic advance on their contents. I mean, they had like a, a big policy and a, a reason, fairly big house. It was out in the mountains and the woman broke down in tears and, you know, I handed her the check and she just like hugged me and I mean, you know, and like every one of those claims, it was like I had a big like tear spot here. I had to like get a, needed to get like a special tear pad, like absorbent pad right. for tears for my shoulder. Um, <clears throat> and it was surprising because I wasn't expecting it at all. I mean, I was I was kind of inside my own head a little bit because I was it was the first time I'd done like a large loss like that. I had a few years of claims experience already as doing cat hail. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> and I was kind of like, well, I want to make sure I say the right thing. Am I doing writing this check right? You know, I'm like kind of, I'm not thinking about outside of myself and until, you know, it's, it's like little things that happen in, in over the course of a career or your life in general, I guess, where things will happen and I'll nudge you in a certain way. Right. Like I was going down the trip, the, the journey this way, kind of sort of inside my own brain. And then that happens. And I see, you know, a really strong manifestation of what my actions do in somebody else's life and it nudges me this way. Right. And then, so I don't know. I wanted to kind of talk a little bit about, one of the kind of uh, sort of one of the big benefits I think of this job that, that you can have, especially when you start, whether it's small losses or large losses, but it's probably more common with large loss like that, where you're having an effect on somebody's life, right? A big effect. And when you have somebody like start crying on your shoulder because you just handed them a check for some, however many thousands of dollars to, to for whatever, um, you know, you start to see that it's not all about you or me, right. you know, whatever. Um, I had a claim um, several years after that, and I, I've had a few of these 
where I would go to insurance house and it's an elderly person and they're by themselves and their spouse is dead, you know, passed away. <clears throat> and in this case, it was a, this old guy and he was telling me story after story after story after story. And when I, when I was like, all right, you know, I'm like, I finished the everything. I was done with the claim, right? I'd written the estimate and, you know, handed him the estimate and went over the numbers and all that stuff. And he wanted me he just were nailed to the couch, right? And every time I tried to like, okay, well, you know, it's been, if you have any questions, well, let me tell you about the time. And he just, yeah. he just kept going. And, and you know, at first I was like kind of annoyed. I was like, I got I'm, I'm running up against my next appointment. And I looked at him I looked in his face and the man was like, like just staggeringly lonely, right? He was, he wanted me to just hang out with him for a little bit, listen to his stories. He wanted me to show, he wanted to show me, you know, uh, his hobbies. He had some guns and stuff he wanted me to see and like this cool knife from World War II and whatever. It was, you know, he was an old guy. And so I was like, you know what? I'm just going to hang out, you know, it'll be all right. You know, if I, I can... The next appointment, I've got time. I'm, I can take some time to just sit with this guy and spend a little bit of time with him and, you know, engage with him, talk with him about his, his stuff and be wowed by this. And, you know, oh my, I can't believe that happened. He worked in the railroad security for a long time and had all these tons of crazy stories. I can't remember any of them, but he was like one story right after the other. He was, I finally, I had to like peel myself out of there. And as I was like, you know, leaving the house, like, you know, pulling the door shut, he was still like trying to tell me a story as I'm going out the door. And <clears throat> you have an opportunity as an adjuster to have an impact on people's lives. And you're gonna, you're gonna find that you run into people who are like, we said it before, they're in all like, they're any socioeconomic status. They're any like emotional status. You know, he had recently lost his wife. Right. You know, they'd been married for fifty-seven years, something like that. And I mean, he was he was an old guy. <clears throat> and people are, you know, they're experiencing the highest of the highs in their life, and they're the lowest of the lows, and, and literally every single thing in between, right? And it's. The whole concept of empathy, when we talk about empathy with this work, it extends beyond just, oh, well, it's inconvenience of having a claim. Shoot, you know, gosh, I'm really sorry you had this claim. You know, is everybody okay? Man, I'm really sorry to hear about that, blah, 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 blah. It's, it's being more, even more genuine about that and understanding with the context of that claim, or the, or that claim in the con greater context of their life, what they may be going through. And you don't, you just don't know, right? I mean, we talked about it, like, a person may have, severe chronic pain, right? Getting up and walking to go answer the door may cause them excruciating pain just to, to say hi to you. And then you think mm -hmm. that they're being a jerk because they're making a face at you or they're being yep. short because they're like trying to stay upright because they're in so much pain. You have no idea. You just right. don't have any idea. Um, so empathy is super important. When we get out of our own heads and we get out of our own you know, sort of mercenary attitude with this job. It's easy to do, certainly, because, you know, the more claims I can close, the more money I can make. And at the end of the year, then I've got more money, right? But you have to think about the people that you're dealing with. And it's every, every one of these is an opportunity to, to, you know, convert a heart and a mind, not just to like the fact that, you know, not every thing that you've ever heard about insurance is necessarily true, but that you have an opportunity to show people, you know, or to, to help ease a person's anxiety and concerns for a small time while you're with them. Right. Right. So I kind of wanted to just talk about that a little bit because I, I, I feel like there's a lot more to this job than just, you know, do I need Xactimate level two certification? Right. How much money am I going to make on this? Or how much money, you know, what about this fee build? Can I negotiate hourly versus component? Blah, 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 right? This is, there's a whole other side to this thing. It's the, it's the person to person side of this job, which gets left out. Are you interested in more than just punching a clock and paying the bills? Wouldn't you rather be on the A-team surrounded by the best of the best in the industry? 
then you need to check out Eberl Claim Service. For well over 30 years, Eberl's philosophy of treating adjusters as they wish to be treated has allowed them to establish a vast network of the most professional, educated, and dedicated adjusters in the industry. So at Eberl, you're in good company. If you're a motivated and compassionate adjuster slash claims professional, Eberl wants you to represent their organization. Go to jobs.eberls.com right now and get started with Eberl Claim Service. Honestly, that's what brought me into this business. So there was two things that had happened. So my first real exposure to adjusting, what really pushed me towards that direction was during Hurricane Harvey, I was down in Houston and I was working. It's a long story, but I was down there working with some guys on a a towing company we were moving cars flood cars for um insurance companies for iaa and and um you know most cars we pulled at that time were actually for state farm but um what was happening was is that you know these people their their houses are flooded out i mean i I don't know i mean you didn't go to harvey i don't think but i've worked such a in houston now but you know it it's bad i mean it's was <clears throat> and the widespread amount of flooding that happened down in that area from 100 miles west more than 100 miles west of houston all the way over to louisiana you know and so many people affected <laughs> half that city floods when somebody puts I a sprinkler know. in the yard <laughs> i know but just the number of people that be hurricane harvey was pretty bad you know how far north it went how far west it went so I'm I'm staying in an RV in an RV park, you know, and, and um, there was a guy that I went to high school with. He was down there working doing flood claims. And there was another guy that was uh, staying there. He was actually working with Pilot, I believe. And, and I was having a conversation with him about what he did. And he says, you know, I, I make great money. I love what I do, you know. But what I really do is I concentrate on the people. I concentrate on... If I take care of the insured and do what's right for them, the money will come to me. And that's what I try to do. I don't worry about how much I'm making on a claim. I just want to do the right thing for the insured, and that's where I get my satisfaction from. And then the, the light kind of hit me was, I don't know how many times where I'd gone to somebody's house, they're, they're not even living in their house because their house is just flooded out. You know, The cars in the garage turned sideways because the water's lifted it and turned it sideways. And I'm hooking up a winch cable from God knows how far away, trying to turn this vehicle inside the garage so I can get it drug out of there. And I get it towed away, and the homeowner arrives and says, thank you. Thank you for getting that out of here for us. And this way, because now that we had possession of it, they can get a check, they can get a car, and it's the next step in their recovery. And it was the first time in my life just for doing my job, man. Yeah. I never expected a, a thank you. Never even wanted a thank you for doing. I'm one of those guys. Guys, hey, hey, your your appreciation for doing your job is your paycheck. So shut up, quit. Don't ask <laughs> me to say please or thank you. But um, knowing that just that one little thing helped that person get to the next level in that recovery or what they were going through. Yeah. You know, and I will remember one these people's house I went to that were they were way out south. You know, kind of south and west of of um, Houston, and you got back to where they were at, and there was dead fish everywhere. Well, the river had come up, okay, it, but it receded pretty quick, and there were dead fish all over the place. Some of it had been chewed on by raccoons and other animals, mm-hmm. but it, the stench. Oh man! Okay, oh, I was. I mean, we're talking. I'm almost a month. When I made it to this house, I had been down there for almost a month. So this place was just awful. And these people had to deal with this. These people had to deal with one of the first things they had to do was was just get as much of those fish away from their out of their house, away from their house, Oof. everything else, just so that they could start the recovery because of the stench. What kind of fish were they? A bunch of carp, you know. I saw, I saw some. So they were big, fish. fat ones. Oh yeah, it just because by the time I get there, they're bloated and just rotted and maggots all over them, and and and, and these people are having to deal with all this crap, you know, just so they can get started and. And they had even found a way to drag their vehicles up to the road, uh-huh. you know, for me to hook up to them up there. And I was like, y'all didn't have to do this. I go, yeah, but you don't want to go down there. 
you know right. but we thank you for coming and getting them you know and one of them was a pickup truck i opened the door and it smelled like dead fish or rotted fish i don't know if you've ever opened up a, ref- a freezer that's oh yeah uh, oh yeah so this is, <laughs> this is about what this truck smelled like so that's what it was for me that drove me to get into this business because i thought you know what this is a chance for me to help people make a difference in some lives and and hopefully I'll get the satisfaction of it. So that's what I focus on today. When I go out and look at something, I don't care how they treat me. You know, I mean, I'm I'm one of those guys. I kind of half walk around with a chip on my shoulder, going to knock it off. You know, I'm 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 quick at the tongue. If you want to say something to me, I'll fire right back at you. But something happened with this career that man. If I go to an insurance house and and they just start lashing me, I shut up. You know. Yeah. Yeah. Never in my, I have stories from back when I worked on a service drive at a dealership and people would get very rude with me and the stuff I'd come back with them at is very well documented. <laughs> <laughs> I've got Yelp reviews I can show you. you <laughs> <laughs> one star. Yeah. So we call uh, them one star James. That's pretty much it. You know, <laughs> I had the greatest CSI rating in the dealership. But anyway, the. But when I started this business, I was able to understand what these people are going through. I was able to understand that this is an event in their life that they didn't ask for. Yeah. They did absolutely nothing, you know, to be in the situation that they're in. Except for some people are in their cars and they do stupid things in them. But, uh, but, that's, but when you're dealing with a catastrophe and you're dealing with that, man, these people did nothing. And they're, they're just trying to recover and move on and you got to have some empathy for those people yeah you don't know what they went through you don't know it was like the little old lady that i dealt with whose husband had passed away and he'd handled everything for her oh, yeah she i mean i don't think that she had even she she even told me a story about how all her electricity got shut off shortly after he died because she didn't know how to pay the bills right right yeah because he'd always handled common. it you know yeah and so she's trying to figure all this stuff out and you know, and you just have to, I mean, if, if you're going to go into this thing and it's all about you, I mean, <clears throat> when I meet people and they just, they go, man, you seem like you're doing really well. You seem like you're doing really well. Man, I want to do that. I want to make that kind of money. And I said, then you don't need to do this job. <laughs> yeah, right. You know, yeah. I mean, I mean, really, I mean, I want you to make great money, but I don't want money to be the factor of you coming into this. Because if you're, I think that if you come into this just chasing the money, and this is my opinion, Okay, I think if you come into this industry just looking for the money, you're coming into it for the wrong reasons. That's that is true. I 100 percent agree with that. Totally. You, know, you and, really you got to want to you have to want to do the job, and it is it's a it's a lifestyle. Um, if you're not all in on it, like that part of it, then it's it's not. We have we have a lot of people in it that are not all in. To, to that part of it. There, it's again, like I, we said before, it's, it's, it's a little bit of a mercenary kind of a culture that we have, which is, I don't think is very useful. Mm-hmm. I mean, it's great that people are self starters and they want to be like, have basically run their own business and make their own, you know, pave their own way through the world. But it's, it has to be with the heart of a servant and not at the heart of I'm trying to get, gather it all to me. Right. Um, <clears throat> there is a, a little bit of a dichotomy, I would say, between, you know, when we talk about volume and then we talk, we're now talking about like, you know, customer service and hanging out with the customers and helping them. I don't, I don't think that those are incongruent with right. each other because, um, there is a, I think there's a point of diminishing returns when you, when you, people will, will, uh, and I've seen this in action where a firm will, in order to increase customer service scores or touch point scores or NPS ratings or all that stuff, they will uh, encourage the adjuster to stay longer at the insurance house and to engage them more. And just hanging out at an insurance house and like talking with them is not necessarily gonna guarantee a higher right. NPS rating or NPS score. Um, it's it's a quality over quantity. If you see if you're rushing through it and you're going you're running gun super fast, yeah, right. There's obviously, you know, there's you need to spend more time with the insured for sure. Mm-hmm. But it's not a matter of like sitting down with them 
and like doing each other's hair and and you know painting each other's nails and all that kind of stuff and and, and trying to. But like, I enjoy those meetings with clients. Yeah, with insurance. That's, and you, know. you don't have to, to go to that level where you're sitting down having Oprah, Oprah moments with everybody. You want to. The way you help them is by anticipating their fears and setting expectations and letting them know that, that if later if they have more questions, they have an expectation that they can get a hold of you easily. Mm-hmm. And that you're, if, you, if they're not gonna be able to get a hold mm-hmm. of you directly, immediately, like when I call, that you're gonna get back with them quickly, right? And you establish mm-hmm. that just by doing it, right? Um, there's a little thing that I like to kind of teach and refer to, and I call it the, the it's basically the, the, the joy and fear spectrum. Right. So on the left side, all the way over to the left is like the greatest pleasure and enjoyment you could possibly have. You just won the lottery. It's pure happiness, you know, elation. It's right. On the other end of that is you're being chased by a grizzly bear and you're losing the race. Right. It's, it's complete primal terror in the middle is where we live. Right. So I would say that before you get onto the terror side, the fear side of everything, the farthest, the least like joyful thing is to be, to have no, to have like a, a, no anxiety, uh, right at all. The second you introduce a, a slight amount, amount of anxiety, then you're on the fear side. You know, facing a lawsuit can be a terrifying and stressful experience, jeopardizing your years of hard work and success. If you don't have adequate insurance coverage as an adjuster, you're putting yourself at great financial risk. If you make your living from handling claims as an independent adjuster, then you must get errors and emissions and general liability insurance coverage. It doesn't matter if you're a 1099 or a W-2 or you work carrier direct, protect yourself with professional liability insurance from Kaplik. To find out more and to download the insurance for adjusters free guide, head on over to cplic.net slash adjuster TV. That's cplic.net slash adjuster TV. When we get claims, when an insured files a claim and we, we're calling that person, they're over into the deep, pretty deep into the fear side of things already. Even if they are not normally a fearful person, they've got anxiety because they're thinking about all the things that they, you know, they, they've heard about insurance companies. This is going to be a big pain. They're, they're preparing for a fight, right? They're, that's not on the joy side of the spectrum. <clears throat> we don't have to bring people over to the joy side all the way. Mm-hmm. If we can get them right to the middle, right? Or, you know, get them to the point, because they're still going to have some anxiety about some part of the process. Well, I got to find a contractor and that causes anxiety, right? Even if their their interaction with me is a little bit on the joy side where there's no anxiety, it's flat, right? Um, but we have to do our best to remember that how far over on the anxiety side. And I'm going to make an assumption that they're, most people are pretty far over into, they've got a, 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 a relatively high level of anxiety about the at least about the process, having to deal with this now on top of all the other things that they have to deal with, right? As just being alive and just having all the things that everybody does all the time, right? If I can, I want to always try to bring them, reduce that anxiety, right? right? And it, 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 the more you deal with people, the more you start to see that there's the same questions come up, the same fears, what if it's, it's, what if contractors say it's going to be more, right? Well, what if I can't get it done for this amount, right? Everybody, everybody asks that. If they don't ask it, they're thinking it. If they're not asking me, they're thinking it, and then they're calling their agent and asking them, right? So I'm going to answer all those, all those fear questions that I know. It's like when you watch Wheel of Fortune and they get down to the final thing and they automatically put RST. R S T L N E on there right. because those are the most common. Everybody always picks those. So they put those up automatically and then you pay, start picking your letters, right? R S T L N E is what I'm doing in my spiel to the insured. It doesn't matter what the total is, right? right? It just matters that everything that they were worried about and everything I found is explained to them. And then I hit in all those questions that I know that they're going to have. 
right? Sometimes somebody comes up with a left field question, you know, that, and then you go, well, I'll answer that question. But generally speaking, it's the spiel covers all the things that they're going to be scared of and that they, they're going to, it helps them to know what the next steps are. And then I ask them if they have more questions. So do you have any questions about the process at all? Any, any, any thoughts, concerns, whatever, right? You're making direct eye contact because I'm at the person's house when I do this, whether I'm closing the, the claim on site or not, I'm going over this stuff with them in person on site. Right. Yeah, you know, actually, we were wondering, you know, well, what if this and what if that and blah blah. blah. Or no, everything. I th- you, you covered. I think you covered everything. Well, listen. Later, if you do come up with, if something else comes up, if you have any more questions, if you guys find more damage to the house, if you, if you're, you know, you said you didn't find any damage to the inside of the house. If later on you just happen to spot something in the closet or whatever, call me. And let me know, and we'll take care of it, and we'll get you, we'll get you squared away. If you have questions, call me. Send me a text message if you're into that, or shoot me an email, whatever. You got all my contact info, right? That, I mean, it's, for most people, for a lot of people, that is as effective as sitting down with them and listening to their stories about when they worked security on the railroad for 50 years, right? Because it's taking their anxiety level about the process down, at least some, right? They're still gonna have, you know, I'm not going to be be so like cocky that I would say I'm going to make them like feel like they just won the lottery when I'm done with them. But at least they're I've, I've knocked that down a little bit. Which listen, it, it benefits me because it knocks down phone calls later. Them calling me back to ask more questions, or worse, them calling my manager to ask questions and saying I didn't explain it right, or calling their agent who then calls my manager, or who calls my manager's manager who then calls my manager. Right? I don't want any of those phones ringing for really any reason, right? Unless there's something that's out of my control. Um, and then I'm making the call. The phone's ringing because I'm calling them, not because someone, right. it's not, they're not getting blindsided or blindsided. So Again, I'm just going to go back to the fact that my greatest satisfaction in this job is helping people through a difficult time. And that's my motivation for it. That's my motivation for what I do yeah. every day in this business. And I've been blessed because of it. You know, I get blessed twofold in two different ways. One is, of course, you know, one thing we always talk about, the money. Okay. It's been really good to me. But then the other is just, you know, I just, I feel good about myself at the end of the day. You know, there, and there's, and there's times I've denied claims or I've, and I've just gone, you know, I, I hated it, you know, because I know the people had misunderstood what they had. Right. You know, or knowing that they didn't understand their deductible, you know, and they had this just ungodly huge deductible. I mean, anybody that worked in Louisiana, they saw some five digit, you know, five digit uh, deductibles on some houses that weren't that big, you know, yeah, yeah. And, and it just, and you're trying to explain that to the people. And, you know, I heard one guy and it, we got into a nice little argument about this. He said, I just looked at him and said, I'm not the one that did this to you. You and your agent decided this was the best thing for you. And I guess that was a bad decision. Just something like that. you know. <laughs> and the guy was bragging. The guy was bragging about this conversation he supposedly had with an insurance. So I don't know how much of that was just braggadocio or how much of that was really happened. But I'm sure something somewhere in the middle that he shouldn't have ever said it. You know, and I just remember telling him, I said, dude, that's just the wrong thing to say. You know, why would you do that to them? Yeah. You know, that's not your that's not your place to say that. No. Yeah, they're upset. This is what's going through their mind, but put yourself in their shoes. I'd be smart enough not to sign a contract where I got a fifteen thousand dollar deductible and I'm like going, Well, let me ask you a question. Do you even own a house? Right. You know, and the guy guess what? He didn't. But anyway. It was just it, It's not it's not thinking outside of themselves. It's it's thinking about how they got one over on somebody else. A lot, listen, a lot of adjusters are, they're like internet lawyers, yeah. right? They're, they're experts on everything. Another thing I, I see guys do sometimes, and if, if, I'm a, if I'm doing field support or I'm out you know, doing ride-alongs with adjusters and they start over explaining everything, yeah. right? First of all- I was guilty of that at one time. Is, is it really that important that the insured knows how much you know about whatever construction, whatever yeah. it is, or, you know, if they're standing there with the contractor, 
arguing over the smallest, tiniest possible little thing, and it becomes a giant thing. One thing I think adjusters don't really understand is that when you get into it with a contractor in front of the homeowner, put, put yourself in the position of the oh, homeowner. Oh, I know. Right? Even if the contractor starts it, you know, it starts a little verbal, you know, shoving game. If you engage with that and you start fighting back or, you know, he's said something that you know isn't true and you got to correct the record and, you know, I'm just being honest and, or he's, you know, impugning your resume saying you don't know anything and then you start rattling off all the stuff that you've ever done with construction. Why well, you know this? Da, 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 da. Come on. It doesn't move the claim forward, first of all. Second of all, the homeowner is standing there with two people in their kitchen, you know, one person that they asked to be there, whether the person was canvassing the neighborhood or not, it does not matter. That person is in their house upon invitation, right? And they may be the ones doing the work. That person has a relationship with the contractor. If the guy shows his rear end and acts like a jackass and you engage with them, then you're both a couple of jackasses, right? And then what happens then? You know, is the claim moved in a, into a positive place? Has it resolved some issue? If you, if the if the people are, if the adjuster and the contractor are arguing in the front yard, no, not at all, not even a little bit. In fact, it's it it makes it, it pushes the insured the wrong way on the fear spectrum. Their anxiety level is going to start to crank yep. up to where they may even be afraid that you're going to start. There's going to be a physical confrontation in the front yard. You know then who knows what can happen. If, if, the, if the contractor is unreasonable and is calling you names and you know, impugning your, your, your mom's character or whatever, you can't take any of that stuff personally. And if you're the one that seems to be calm and cool and collected, not being like, you know, oh, this guy's being mean to me or I'm gonna fight back and stand up to this guy, if you're just professional, let the guy do his thing. Keep your keep your normal stone face. I mean, that guy digs his own his, he digs his own grave and falls right. right into it, right? You don't have to do anything. It's it's hard to do because when you know if if you let your pride get in, even slide in a little bit and you feel like well you know I mean I know I'm a better adjuster than this guy as a contractor and da 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 and I know more I I know I know more than he does and then you start trying to think of these things and you're saying them and you're fighting and back and forth and. No, it just it spirals out of control always, every time. There's no, there's no clever comebacks. There's no winning with okay. clever comebacks. There's no winning with just telling the truth or being honest or engaging that kind of thing in any way ever. ever. I just smile and say, we're just going to disagree on this. Yeah. You know, and, and I'll walk away and think in my head, well, at least one of us got paid to be here today. Yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> you know, that's, I, I want to say that, but I just... Just don't say a word. It's hard I, just, to do. I just I just think it. Just going. Yeah, at least one of us got paid today. Yeah. You have to reassure reassure the insured that you are still there to help, and you know it's they're in a pickle because they've got the insurance company guy there who is trying to save money. You know they don't want to pay claims, and then you got this contractor guy there, and his job is to try to make make all the money that he can. So what do I do? Who do I believe? Da, 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 da. It's not your job to try to make anybody believe anything about anything. You can't do it. You just have to be more professional, be a good example, let the chips fall where. They, I mean, if if it gets to the point where the guy is, you know, he's trying to start a fight, yep. I'm just gonna say. Listen, you know, I've gone over the numbers and everything, you guys, and, and I'm talking to the homeowner. If you have any questions, you know, if you guys find more, I've, I've finished my spiel, right? You know, right. give me a call, um, and uh, we'll be in touch, you know, or whatever it is. And then I'm leaving. I'm not going to stand there and engage that. Right. And then I'm going to immediately call the, the agent, because because right. the homeowners, I mean, there's, I'm, and I'm not going to try to wait out the contractor and let, you know, because if it. It could be there all day long, right. you know. The fact that the contractor is still there talking to the homeowner when I leave. I can't control that. They, they're at the insurance house when I'm not there at all because, you know, they have meetings with the homeowners to try and get them to sign and everything. Right. So I'm not at any of those other meetings. I can't influence, I can't have the kind of influence that I'm thinking I, I think I can. I don't have the power other than to just be in control of myself. Right. It's long story short. Um, and 
if things go sideways, if the insured believes the contractor over you, at least there's nothing that, that they can say that you like engage with them or like started you know using foul mm-hmm. language or, or making a, a butt out of yourself with that person. You were professional. You said, you know, I, I think our meeting's done here. We'll uh, we'll be in touch, and they call the agent immediately. These days, there are a growing number of remote work opportunities for independent adjusters. With Scoper Writer programs popping up all over the place, you can do photo and scope in the field, or you can just sit at home in your pajajays and write the estimates on what the scoper got when they were out in the field. And it doesn't matter where you live, as long as you have the internet, you can write claims as a desk adjuster, but you can't get that sweet gig without being licensed. So if you live in Nebraska, which doesn't require an adjuster to be licensed, you still have to have a New York license to write claims somebody scoped in New York, makes sense? Of all the credentials you need as an adjuster, there really is none more important than your adjuster license, especially your first one. You're gonna need it to do just about everything else, including some adjuster schools even require you to have one before they'll let you enroll. So you need Adjuster Pro. Adjuster Pro provides a comprehensive and easy to use way to get and maintain your adjuster licenses. Most importantly, Adjuster Pro was founded by independent adjusters and the team at Adjuster Pro is dedicated to helping you thrive as an adjuster with resources for every licensing state, including dead simple CE packages. Adjuster Pro is the gold standard for adjuster licensing. You'll find everything you need to get licensed in one place. Go to adjustertv.com slash adjuster pro right now. And then call call your manager. After that, luckily, to this point, that's never happened to me. So to have oh, it's a matter somebody, of time. Somebody calls a manager on me. Luckily, that has not happened. I've had I've had contractors, I've had body shops, just upset with me, you know, and and I'll just say, look, this is the way I saw it. I'm following the guidelines that I've been given. Yep. The way that I'm interpreting our guidelines, and this is how I see it, you know, and I wish there was more that I could do for you today, but there's nothing I can do, Yeah, you know, and, um, and I understand you being upset. I understand the, the situation you're in, nothing I can do about it right now. And I wish, I know that's not what you want to hear. I understand that. And I wish there was more that I could do, but I can't. And I just leave it at that. And I said, I hope, you know, reach out to me if you have any more questions. Yeah. You know, well, and then, and then what happens is, is that the, the contractor will demand a reinspection, thinking that he's going to get a different adjuster, yep. right, and play musical adjusters. Um, but what I'll do in that case is, if I, if if it's if I, early in my career, I'd have a manager with me. Later on, I'm just going to go back and just deal with it again, unless we need to have the manager and the, and sometimes the agent will be there, right, so that we can have a little bit more of a united front of. People there who are like just saying, "Listen, we're we're trying to be professional about this, and this guy is off the rails," you know. And then they're able to, you know, if you have a manager there, um, and even the agents, they're they have more power than you do, right? As mm-hmm. the adjuster, they can they can say things, they can make decisions that you can't, right. or that you can't without their permission anyway. So and they have a relationship with the person. They've that got you a don't relationship, have. yeah. So the, so the agent has a relationship with the person. The agent can pay the claim out of, you know, he can. They can do whatever they want to do, right? right? Um, but that's out of his pocket. That's not out of whoever's right. pocket. If he wants, if you, if it's worth it to him to do that, it's rare. I've only ever heard of that like once or twice in twenty years. But sometimes the customers got you know a lot of policies. They've got a bunch of commercial policies. They got a bunch of vehicles. They've got several rental houses. Or they got, have family members that are connected to it, and that whole yeah. network of people that came to that person. Yeah, so it's, yeah. And it's, listen, the smaller the town is, the more everybody's connected in that way. And it may be that it's their family, right? Right. So, I don't know. That's It, it can get sticky with those things. The best thing to do is to disengage early when you see things start to kind of go sideways after you've, you've if you've done your job and given your spiel and and did, done your report and everything then you just have to kind of leave it kind of leave it in god's hands a little bit yeah. and then make some make a couple of phone calls just to cover your butt. when it goes negative i don't hang around long no do not you know i don't try to i i try to make that the rest of that conversation as short as i can possibly make it get to my points explain that's my points explain there's nothing i can do to change yeah. those points and i'm out man 
I the other wait, thing that and I happens, get in my car and I don't sit in front out there and get my stuff together and, and make my oh notes no. and everything else. <laughs> no, I put that sucker in park. I go down the street around the corner, sit in the parking lot somewhere and finish up. Make, down the, make the calls. Yeah. So generally what happens is, and this is a little bit like a, a it's not a, a thing that's confrontational, but it can, it spirals in kind of the same direction. And that is when you start to get into although something I call roofer theory. And that is basically where the roofer theorizes that the hail was actually spear shaped, like spear tip points, right? So it had, yeah. you know, so they'll they'll say, well, you know, what we based on what we could see here, and you know, what we what we've seen on other houses, and uh, based on you know science, these hailstones are unique in this area. You know, it's not like that Texas hail that you guys get, which you know, I don't know why guys would say that. Um, They'll say it's pointy on one end because it's falling down th through the air. The air resistance will yeah. kind of like uh, it'll shape the hail into a, a spear point. Like, you know, like a plumb bob is, you know what that yeah. is? Yeah. They look kind of like they're, they're like kind of, it's like a reverse teardrop. So like it's, it's heavy on one end, which drives the point into the That doesn't make sense because the, the heavy side is going to be the round side, which will be gravity will pull that first. Right. So, and then they'll say, well, this is why you're seeing just one or two granules knocked out of that. I mean, you just, the warranty on the roof, I mean, you can't, it's not even, you have to total that roof out. It's just all, it's absolutely, they're blisters, right? right? And then I had, I mean, we can go into roofer theory is one of my favorite things, right? The guys that were telling me had a split level, right? It's 312 roofs. So it was really easy to walk on and you could step up to the second level and the lower level had a great big pine tree over the back slope, right? And so it had a, like lichen and moss and stuff was like pop, there's black spots all over it from the tree being hanging, having branches hang over it. The upper part had a perfectly clear view of the sky. <laughs> and these two guys, and they fought, I mean, they were like, we've, if you engage in roofer theory, theory d debates, you know, these scientific, you know, symposium. You'll be there all day long. You're gonna be there all day long. Because it's 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 you're arguing with nonsense. These guys were trying to tell me they're absolutely, and they they got heated about it. It's these two old guys and they had a little beat up pickup truck in the driveway. Nothing wrong with that necessarily, but because this is hail day, you can't say this. The reason why I'm like this up here has a clear view of the sky and there's not one spot on it up here. I mean, I understand how I said I know what that is. It's from that tree because of the things that are like. And they looked at each other and laughed. This is up in Wisconsin. This is, we don't get hail up here like you do down in Texas. And I'm like, I, I've never worked Texas hail. At that point, at that point in my career, I had never worked Texas hail. I never been, I've never been to Texas, but anyway. So they were absolutely convinced that because the lower roof was lower, that the hail hit it harder because of gra more gravity down there. I was like, what? Listen. <laughs> I took pictures and I said, you guys, I mean, I appreciate you trying. And they're like, wow, we're serious. I'm like, I'm going to call the insured and explain this and everything because the insurance wasn't there. And I'm calling them as I'm climbing down the ladders just so that they didn't, couldn't call first, right? Explain everything to the homeowner. And the homeowner was like, what? <laughs> and I, I was like, listen, I, there's some black spots on the back. So I explained everything, you know, I explained what it was. I said, your roof is in, is in great shape. It's common to see that. Anybody who's got a tree hanging over their, their composition roof has that somewhere on, on. and okay, okay. And I was like, listen, but listen, if you get another contractor out there, somebody else comes by and wants to take a look at it and they're convinced you have hailed it, oh, we'll, we'll come back out and, and meet them and talk to them. You know, we want to make sure that you're confident that what we're saying is you know, we're on, we're, we're, we're being honest with you and that we're shooting you straight. We're giving you a fair shake, right? right? Okay. All right, cool. Yeah, no problem. Thanks. Call the agent on that one. I mean, anytime it's something maybe goes sideways, I'm calling the agent for sure. That, uh, reminds me of the, uh, the manufactured hell that you'll see the ball peen hell mm -hmm. that we see because ball peen yeah. hammers will a they're all the same size and b there's always going to be a scuff mark a little chip in the paint you know someplace you know and, it, and every dent's going to have the exact same little dot in the paint you're talking about an auto yeah in the same spot and the people are, oh no the hell caused that and you have to explain to them that hell isn't abrasive yeah, it's ice. It's frozen it's water. It's not abrasive. It, uh, it doesn't do that. Well, how can you explain that the bricks, you know, the hail hit those bricks and... Chipped them. Chipped them. 
That's impact. Because the hail is, force impact. is ice. It is hard. Okay. Yeah. It'll hurt if it hits and you. It hurts. And if it's wind driven, you know, I mean, it breaks paint. You know, I've even seen sure. it. You know, I mean, I've seen dents made by hell that, on a vehicle that you couldn't believe was made. Hey, let's refer back to my little story of being in Wiley, Texas. You know, my F-150, brand new. Okay. Hell hit the wheel well in the bed and knocked it loose from the body. Wow. Yes. Well, I have that's photos for that. Ford. Yeah, well, maybe. It was the first year of the aluminum body, you know. Anyway. Right, right. But, Never uh, by the first year of anything. So, uh, but, you know, it, it yeah, it'll, it'll do some destruction, but it didn't scratch the paint. <laughs> right, right, exactly, yeah. You know, yeah. It, it, it cracked the paint from the impact, but it didn't scratch. There wasn't a single scratch on that truck. Yeah, yeah. So, anyway, it, it's the same thing. I love that roofer theory. Well, the point... Well, if you understand physics, that that's at a point. Now, this is going to be the heavy part back here, which means it's going to turn that way. Yeah, no, and guys, that's what's going to happen. These guys were, you know, they were a couple of MIT, uh, you uh-huh. know, physicists. And then, you know, th- then there's the hidden damage thing. Well, you're not going to be able to see the damage until six months from now. It's got to have some, see, you know, go through a winter up here, and you know, you'll see that hail damage. It'll pop out of there. You can see hail damage the second after the hail hits. Oh, yeah. It's right there. You can see it. Especially if you've, if you've got experience looking at hail damage, you it's hard to miss it. You know, it's like when you buy a you know a purple car, you start seeing purple cars everywhere, right? Yep. So yeah, it is. I guess long story short on this is it's kind of it's easy to forget that you're part of a team, right? Yep. So you're you it, when you're out there in the field and maybe you've got remote management. And there's no office to go into, especially these days with everything being all digital. There's no office to go into. So you get on a conference call at the beginning of the storm and get the little, you know, the orientation thing. And then that's it. Then you just claims just start showing up in your queue and you're off to the races. You ever feel like you've been thrown to the wolves by the IA firms you work for, like you're just a number on a roster? Wouldn't it be nice to work with a firm who's big enough to get plenty of work, but still small enough to know you by your first name? Then let me tell you about my friends at the Oklahoma-based IA firm, Paysetter Claim Service. Founded in 1997, the thing that sets Paysetter apart is their relentless pursuit of excellence. They hold themselves and their team of adjusters to a higher standard of quality. And now with their advanced all-in-one claims platform called Evo, you'll get a real-time Uber-style map and communication link to the insured, automatic messages sent to customers throughout the process, file review automation, and a fast, accurate scope with Paysetter's partnership with Hover. Hover is integrated directly into Evo, making for a smooth and seamless field scoping experience for you as the adjuster. Technology is moving faster than ever, and Paysetter is right there at the cutting edge. AdjusterTV.com slash Paysetter. When you are out there by yourself, you forget. You forget that you're, you know, you've got it. When you put that claim together, that especially from a customer service standpoint, that you uh, you help other members of your team by helping the customer understand the process mm-hmm. and reassuring them that you know the, ne- the what the next steps are, how they can get a hold of somebody if they have a question or an issue or or the estimates are coming back higher, or whatever it is, right? Because if if they know exactly what to do in all of the circumstances, the chances of them calling your other team members, like your manager or whoever it is, uh, is goes down considerably, right? So we always talk about trying to not make other people's phones ring. All of these things, I call it the, the circle of happiness. If I make the customer happy, then it makes the carrier happy, and if the carrier's happy, it makes the firm happy, and if the firm's happy, then they're gonna wanna keep me busy, which makes me happy, Kids right? Put some more money in your bank account. Yeah. You buy stuff. So, in a way, I am still a bit of a mercenary, but I recognize that I get a lot more, I make a lot more, uh, it's, it's more beneficial to me to do a great job and to, re- to take care of the insured, not to spend too much time with them over explaining things and like, you know, 
you, you kind of have to modulate your approach to the person that you're with. Some people may, you know, be like, all right, just give me the facts. Thank you. Catch you later. Right. right. And you're out of there. You're not going to sit there in that guy's living room and, you know, hold hands and whatever. Um, but other people do. They, other people need it. And sometimes you recognize that there's people that outside of the job, you need to spend time with that person because they're, they're alone. They're lonely. Right. Um, for whatever reason. I love hanging out with old people. Yeah. Even if they're not old people, some people, any, people of any age can be lonely. Right. So you can't just like say, Oh, well, this guy's old. I better like make sure, see if he's, you know, I'm just saying just in general for, for anybody, for, for people who, who are listening, it's, they're human beings and some people are missing, you know, a little right. bit of the, the contact with other people and they, people, people crave it yep. unless they're wearing a shirt that says, I hate people. Who does a, such a thing like that? I don't even know. Not with rainbows and Care Bears? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that should be, should start a new insurance company and that's the shirt. And I hate people <laughs> with a rainbow. <laughs> so, well, again, it's just for me, it's, I just, I just think of the policyholder first and if I take care of them then my bank account's going to be taken care of. I'm going to be taken care of. Yeah. I'm going to sleep good at night. I'm going to have less confrontations. You know, and even whenever I have that one person that wants to confront me, you know, again, I get to walk away and think in the back of my head, at least one of us got paid today. You know, yeah. I don't have to say it, but I can giggle on the inside all I want to, you know, yeah. and, but just take care of and do what's right. But be as empathetic as possible. Even when you can't give them good news, you know, be empathetic. And yeah. It's all you can do, man. And remember, have some empathy for that guy who's like losing his mind and the contractor is who's, yeah. who's having a freak Remember out. this, that contractor, he needs to sell a roof to pay his bills. That's right. Exactly. You know, I mean, and that's what he needs. And you may have been the seventh meeting that day that they he got, got denied no. on. Yep. And so he's, and he's getting frustrated. frustrated. Yep. So and keep he's that probably, in mind. And if he's not the owner of that roofing company, he's got a sales manager beating on him. Yep. You know, yep. and uh, and a truck payment beating on him. A thousand dollar super duty payment. Speaking of which, so I had this one. Um, really? This is and this is totally right in line with what we're talking about. I had this one where I was up on the roof with a, a contractor, and the guy was he was probably twenty, young guy, and this was I was probably thirty at the time, thirty two or something like that. Man, back in your younger days. Yeah, back in the salad days yeah so i had a salad once we get up on the roof <laughs> uh and we're looking around and he's like man he's like bro bro listen bro you know whatever you say man we're just, you know we saw this one you know we, we were just in the neighborhood and we thought you know i mean this area this could be borderline maybe it could do it maybe or maybe not da, 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 da. It, gives me, it gives me this whole spiel right and i'm looking at it and i'm looking at it. i want to listen just fact check Right now, fact is, I want to total every single roof I get on. Oh yeah, every time, one hundred percent. Don't we all? But you can't. You got rules. I got oversight. I got QA. I can't just total everything. Otherwise, I, I'm, my career would have been over super fast. So, I'm looking around. I'm looking. I'm looking. You know, I'm looking at the vents. There's nothing on anything. There's the roof. It's not that old of a house. The roof's not very old. And I'm like, listen, dude. I mean, bro, bro. Listen, pal, Bro. I want to total this roof. I really do. I said, you know, I, but it looks like, you know, there's not really anything I could take a picture of on here. There's, I'm, not, I'm not finding what I need to see in order to, to, to justify paying for any, paying anything on this claim, right? There's, not, there's no damage to the sides of the house, yada, yada, yada. So he's like, all right, well, that's cool, man. No, no problem. Yeah, we'll, we'll just catch you on the next one, you know, whatever. And so we start down the ladder and get down in the insured's front yard, standing there in the driveway, and the homeowner, we knock on the door, the homeowner comes out. And he immediately, I start to like say, all right, well, you know, we took a look at the, he cuts me off and starts in with this whole, yeah, you know, uh, we, when we looked at this roof, I mean, we're, we're absolutely uh, positive there is hail damage on this roof. And your adjuster, he doesn't agree with that. And he, st he stabbed me right square in the back, twisted the knife in, right. and I, my mouth just hit the floor. I, and I lost it on that kid right then and there. I was like, I, I, I don't know. I'm not a, like an angry person. You, you know me well enough. You, I don't get that. I'll, I'll back you up on that one today. I'm, I'm a pretty chill dude. <laughs> You're right. But 
he was like, we just, you know, we just have to agree to disagree. We're going to get an adjust, another adjuster out here. We're going to get a reinspection and da, 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 da. Just like, just cocky, just, and I was, I mean, I couldn't believe it. And I just tore into him. I was like, you son of a gun. And gosh darn you, you jerk. Very strong terms that I use. Yeah. I, I was, gosh and, darn it. The problem was, I, because I lost my, I lost my business on this guy in front of the homeowner, basically right. saying, you just literally five minutes ago agreed with me that there wasn't any hail damage on this. What are you trying to do? What is it? What are you trying to pull? The homeowner body language automatically closes up. You know, what's going on here? I don't understand what's, what's happening. Why is the adjuster being so mad at this guy? He's saying, you know, he, the other guy was being reasonable saying this and now the adjuster's being lose. I lose. I, you know, I right. lost that one. Right. Um, call the agent call my manager you know it's so that kind of thing will happen at an absolute left field and you have to re retain control right so what do you do in that situation if you are able to maintain your composure in that situation right do you right. disagree with them you call you say well actually you know this is what happened now it's he said she said right so what do you do yeah I, <sighs> Me, this is me, and I'm not saying this is the right thing to do. I'm going to say, well, this isn't the same conversation that we just had on the roof. However, Mr. Homeowner, this is what we found, okay? To be getting a letter, okay? If something changes, let us know. <laughs> bye. Bye-bye. <laughs> and then go, like, jump in your car and scream at the top of your lungs. With and the then windows make up. the phone call to the agent and the manager and... You know, yeah. Whatever I got, or make my notes, file it, whatever it is, like, the protocol is for that particular carrier. Get it done. Get out of there, because I'm not going to argue with it. You know, because I do have a temper sometimes, and, and I know the best thing for me to do is is just to keep my mouth shut. Yeah. And you know, I'm 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 a little quick tongued every now and then, and I might say something unbiblical, and so just got to get out of there. Yeah. Just hold your composure and get out. You know, just don't engage them. Can't do it. Yeah, you just can't, can't do it. You just can't. I mean, as much as you want to, and trust me, I've had those opportunities, and yeah. it's just he just smile and just go. Well, at least one of us got paid today. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I mean, it may not be what I wanted to get paid today, but at least I got something for being here. Yeah, yeah. My time wasn't totally wasted. <laughs> so, you know. <sighs> I don't really have anything. I'm out of a... Uh, actually, I'm just kidding. <laughs> I had one where I inspected the house and walked around. I mean, the, the homeowners followed me around the whole time. And, you know, hey, they held the end of the tape measure for me a couple of times, you know, as I walk around the house. And, and um, I get up, look at the roof. You know, there's, there's nothing. There's nothing there. But there was some there was some siding blown off the side of the house, and you know I'm looking for everything I can find on this house, you know, just trying to find something for this guy, and and he's like, well, you know, do I do I need to just cancel this claim, you know, and and uh, just tell him forget it? I was like, no. I said, you know, it's, this is not a Louisiana story. There's only one deductible in Louisiana, okay? So I can write up, you know the. He wasn't going to meet his deductible, basically. And so I said, I'll, I'll uh, let me write everything up, okay? And, you know, it's just one deductible. And that way if something else happens, this is documented, and you just go to the next one. One deductible? So in like the a health care deductible? No, so in the state of Louisiana for, for um, um, on hurricanes, you have one deductible per year for a hurricane. So oh, you can have really? like 17 hurricanes, but one deductible. No kidding. No kidding. Now, remember, just because something was a hurricane when it was in the Gulf, when it hit your town, it was not a hurricane, that deductible no longer applies because I'm trying to remember which one it was. So Laura hit, and then I was there when it came through. The, the second storm came through, but it, it hit Texas first, came up the Gulf, and, and came up the coast and went through uh, Lake Charles again. And it caused some more damage, okay, additional damage to some people's property. Like some people, they didn't have their 
their houses, you know, tarped properly or whatever, and it blew the tarps off mm-hmm. and then caused more damage on the inside. Well, that new damage caused by that second storm, because it was not a hurricane, but a tropical storm, that didn't matter. That, that new damage is now a separate deductible. Right. But the third storm that came through, or anything additional from that, is covered. Huh. So for that year. Wow. So... So I said, yeah, we'll just take care of it. You know, we'll, we'll do that. And he's like, all right, super cool. I mean, just the guy was just so, and he's just, he was almost apologetic that he even had me to come out there. Right. You know, like part of my job, don't worry about it. You know, it's a pleasure to meet you and your family. Hope everything works out okay. Great. See you later. Bye. Next day, I look at my, I get messages, look at my messages. I mean, I go and I close it. You know, everything else, no pay under under the document. I explained to the guy, hey, if you get it fixed, you remember, make, make sure you turn that in because that's, you know, all that stuff applies. And uh, and actually, if you got it fixed, you would actually get a little bit of money. It would, if you got it repaired, it would actually, his depreciation was, right. would, would uh, get him a little cash back. Dude calls his agent up, says, I came out there, didn't even get on the roof, said he had no damage. You know, all this other stuff. And I had photos. And granted, I didn't get on the roof, okay? But we're talking this is wind here. I mean, I'm right. going to be able to see the wind damage. I put my ladder up, took the photos. You know, and I, I looked, you know. And, uh, and you can see my photos from the from the ladder. Oh, boy. The garage was a was a, an attached carport. I actually got on top of that, mm-hmm. you know. And I actually found damage on top of that. But anyway, long story short. Guy calls, complains, you know, I got it. They're wanting me to explain this. And I'm like, going, oh, there's nothing to explain. I, mean, I did. I mean, it, it is what it is. Yeah. You know, we replaced all the siding that was needed to be replaced. And we, it was only one side of the house. I found a little bit of wind damage on the carport. There was a hole in the, the barn out back where the went through the metal. It was one piece of metal, you know, corrugated metal. We're going to replace that. The, the metal in his chicken coop blew away you know and he's got a temporary repair on it you know we included all that stuff what else how can i do for it you know but it's just guy was sweet as can be when i was there you know that seemed happens. like the salt of the earth guy you know just seemed like the kind of guy you want to sit around and have some beers with and next thing you know you Fooled find out, yeah next thing you know later on you just wanted to punch him in the mouth yeah you yeah. know but you can't do that it's interesting it's interesting, like, I, I've had, I had, an, my sister was working for me as an assistant for a long time, and she'd make my contact calls, which is the main thing I needed for her to do, and she d- would occasionally put a note in one of the, you know, because I sent her a big long email with the contact information and the appointment times, and then she would send it all back, this person, oh, these are all confirmed, these are left, left messages, whatever, sometimes she would put a note saying that this person was rude, or this person was a stinker, or right. whatever. And, I, you know, I talked to her about it. some of them. She's like, yeah, I mean, he was like, the guy was super condescending and all this kind of stuff. And was so, I, you know, you're going to have trouble with him. And they get out there and the guy's kissing my butt. It's yeah. like being as sweet as can be. And I, it, it occurred to me that, that it may be that some people treat women that way, right. you know, versus the guy. Because I don't know. It's rare for you to make a contact call for the person to be kind of stinky with you or right. for me. But she, it was... You know, one out of ten for her. I've had people that on the phone, you're like going, oh, great, man, this guy. Yeah. You know me, I'm kind of jovial. You know, I'll, I'll kind of try to be as upbeat as I can on the phone and maybe crack a small little joke, you know, or just whatever. And this guy was just like, uh, uh, it was just, you know, all I got was some barely audible grunts Good, out of this right. guy, you know. And I'm like going, this is just going to be a pleasure when I get out there. Get out there, man. The guy was just wonderful to talk to. Yeah. Hey, buddy, what's up, man? What's going on? You know, I'm thinking, guy just had a bad day. Hey, could be meds, you know? right? Could be meds. So I have, I had a neighbor when I was in Kansas City that was uh, the sweetest. He was in his 80s, a sweet little guy. And occasionally I'd see him out there walking one of his little dogs, you know. And he's, oh, Matt, how you doing? da 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 you know, I, it's, you know, what about the weather today? No, no, how's this? How's that? Yada, yada. Um, and one night I was sitting in my living room and 
my door, my front door flies open and he runs into the living room. It's like eight o'clock at night and starts screaming at the top of his lungs. Why are your headlights on in my window? Why are your headlights? And his eyes are like, you know, wild. And I was like, mister, I can't remember your name. What in the world are you talking about? <laughs> and I was like, ran outside. I'm like, what's going on? Like I'm just looking, right? Cause all our houses were super close right. together. And somebody four houses up, we had their car parks behind their house in a little drive thing. And I guess their headlights were, sh- they could see, he could, she was trying to sleep. Come to find out later, he was off his meds. He like he was taking something for something. I don't even know what it was, but you never know, man. You just, you just don't never know. know. Yeah. So you, you have know. to be prepared for anything and you can't take anything personally. Well, what this guy ends up happening was he says to me before I leave, he goes, oh, by the way, when you called the other day, man, I just got, I work offshore and I just got back in. And yeah. uh, and you, I mean, I had just gotten asleep, and you woke me up. So if I was a little rude, I apologize. I'm like, oh, no problem, you know. Yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah and there's great. a lot of people that work nights. Yeah. You know? Oh, I always, I always hate it whenever I call somebody and I find out that third I woke, shift, and I and I find out that I just woke them up. You know, I was like, oh man, you know, I just I just hate that. And, you know, it's part of it, but at the same time, like I've done, I've worked third shift when I was really young, and I know it's like wanting to get that. Sleep. It's for me, it's hard to sleep during the day. And I yeah. finally get to sleep, and then somebody would wake me up. That's just that's just not great. No. So we're down to just two cards here. All right. So did I tell you about the time that my wife asked me to clear the table. You did not tell me about that time. Yeah, I just got the. She goes, "Hey James, could you clear the table?" I had to get a run and start, but I made it. <laughs> No, no, that's not a good one. If you enjoyed this episode of Adjuster TV Radio, leave us a five-star review on iTunes. Find more episodes at adjustertv.com slash podcast. This is Adjuster TV.